Welcome to the course module devoted to the dividend policy of multinational companies. In the video we will extend the information on dividends which you should remember from earlier modules with aspects specifically associated with the international activities of companies. We will also explain how multinationals actually go about assessing their dividend capacity. Finally, we will present the reinvestment strategies most commonly applied by multinational organizations. In the second video of the module, we will shift our attention to the issue of transfer pricing and discuss its role in the facilitation of capital flows among the entities in a multinational group. In earlier modules of the course we discussed the basics of dividend theory as well as commonly applied dividend policies. As you may remember, the primary goal of a company's dividend policy is the maximization of shareholder value. Accordingly, the formulated dividend policy should address the preferences of shareholders who may favor current cash payments to future gains from profits reinvested into projects with positive NPV. You should be aware that the shareholders of many multinationals include institutional investors, for example investment and pension funds, which may have a strong preference for regular dividend payments. The dividend policy of such companies will therefore involve paying out a stable or rising dividend per share. Such an approach is not only in line with the expectations of shareholders, but also helps avoid the dividend signaling effect, thus stabilizing the share price. Apart from the need to satisfy shareholder expectations, the dividend policy of a multinational company must also address the issue of intra-group dividends which allow for the repatriation of profits from subsidiaries to head office, enabling the transfer of funds within the group. In this context, the list of factors influencing the dividend capacity of a multinational company must be extended to encompass so-called blocks on the remittance of dividends which may be enforced by the government of a host country in which the company has a subsidiary. Blocks on remittance are typically, if in place, exchange controls or limits on the transfer of dividends to the parent company, for example, through legal restrictions on the dividend capacity of companies. Multinational companies are obviously interested in avoiding such administrative limitations and several ways exist for achieving this in practice. The most widely used method to bypass blocks on remittances is referred to as transfer pricing. Under this approach, the prices for which goods and services are purchased and sold among group entities are set to such a level that profits are reported at head office or by subsidiaries located in those countries where there are no restrictions on the remittance of funds or where the tax regime is more favorable. Other means of avoiding remittance blocks include using intercompany loans. For example, a subsidiary may, instead of paying a dividend, grant a loan to the parent. The parent may also impose additional fees and charges on its subsidiaries, such as royalties for using trademarks, patents, or for providing consulting and management services, which will be settled within the transfer pricing system. Finally, the parent company may also charge its subsidiaries with various overhead expenses. You should appreciate that all of the ways to avoid remittance blocks which we have mentioned are in fact variations of the transfer pricing approach. We will be explaining the issues associated with transfer pricing in more detail in the next video. 
Let us now consider how a multinational company actually calculates its dividend capacity. As you know, dividends are paid out when a company is profitable, that is when it generates free cash flows which are not reinvested. In the case of multinational companies, gross free cash flow is computed as the company's operating cash flow plus dividends received, less interest paid on debt financing and less income tax. Please note that gross free cash flow, as we have just defined it, does not take into account any reinvestments such as capital expenditure or funds required for the acquisition of other entities, nor does it consider potential increases of capital. When we do incorporate these items into the gross free cash flow formula, we come up with the so-called net free cash flow to equity, representing the amount of money which may be paid out to shareholders within a year, in other words, its dividend capacity. Net free cash flow to equity is calculated as gross free cash flow minus capital expenditure and acquisitions, plus any proceeds from the disposal of subsidiaries and new capital issued. As you can see, the formula may easily be applied using information found in a company's financial statements. Investors may thus use the formula to compare the net free cash flow to equity with the level of dividends actually paid out by an entity. Let us now discuss how multinational companies manage their free cash flows in the context of reinvestment and capital reconstruction. A reinvestment strategy may be perceived from two perspectives, that is in the short and long term. Short term reinvestment requirements stem from the need to maintain a level of working capital necessary to pursue the company's business activities. For example, a company may need to maintain a given amount of inventories in order for its operations to function smoothly. It will therefore reinvest a portion of its gross free cash flows to supplement inventory purchases. Thus, in the short term, the reinvestment strategy results from a company's ordinary course of business and is typically stable over time. On the contrary, long-term reinvestment strategy is associated with the pursuit of new investment opportunities, such as capital expenditure or new acquisitions. Such reinvestments significantly reduce dividend capacity. Accordingly, before making any reinvestment decision, management must convince shareholders that the future gains from the reinvestment of profits will exceed the value of cash dividends, which the shareholders will have to sacrifice. For this purpose, management typically presents shareholders with the results of an investment project appraisal, indicating the expected NPV of the project as well as forecasts of future profitability. Some companies decide to reward their shareholders with script dividends, where the dividend payout is realized in equity instruments. Consequently, investors have a choice of either to maintain the shares received and thus realize gains from the reinvestment or sell the shares in the market. Irrespective of the decision made by shareholders, the free cash flow is retained by the company. Please note that capital expenditure investments and acquisitions sometimes require not only that the company refrain from paying out dividends, but that it also increase its capital by means of issuing new debt or equity instruments. You should also be aware that there are instances of reinvestments where the NPV of the project is actually negative. This will often be the case when the company is obliged to comply with new regulatory requirements, 
for example those related to environmental protection or waste emission. Let us now analyze the impact that capital reconstruction programs have on free cash flow and dividends. For this purpose we will define capital reconstruction as a major change in the capital structure of a company, both relating to equity and debt. Let's start with changes resulting in the lowering of a company's equity through a share buyback scheme. As you know, a share repurchase offers a practical alternative to the payment of a cash dividend and is performed when a business has accumulated a large amount of cash which it cannot effectively reinvest. When a company buys back its own shares in the market, its free cash flow is reduced immediately. However, as a result of the real number of shares decreases and the level of free cash flows which will be generated in future periods as measured on a per share basis may in fact be higher than before the repurchase. Accordingly, a share repurchase scheme may potentially lead to a future increase in the level of dividend per share. Let us now consider the impact that an increase in capital will have on the company's free cash flow and its dividend capacity. A capital increase may occur as a result of issuing new debt or equity. Clearly, when new debt is issued to finance working capital or new investment project, then free cash flows in future periods will decrease by the amount of interest payable on the new debt. Please note, however, that the proceeds from new debt may also be used for other purposes, for example, financing a share repurchase. In such a case, the funds will immediately be distributed to shareholders. Nevertheless, future interest expenses will still reduce dividend capacity in subsequent periods. As we indicated earlier, investment projects may be financed by issuing new shares. In such cases, the total number of shares to which a dividend will be paid increases, which may lead to a fall in the level of dividend per share in future periods.